All right, today we're going to be talking about the various Indian groups who lived in Texas when Europeans first arrived uh, in the Americas in 1492. Uh, one thing before we talk about each of these groups, we should have an understanding that the labels we're about to put on these Indians today is not the labels they would apply to themselves. So we're going to be talking about groups like the Caddos, the Wichitas, the Humanos, the Apaches. All these different groups are made up of, you know, we're going to put labels on them that are for culturally similar groups. So, for example, we're going to talk about the Caddos. These are going to be people that live in, you know, villages of hundreds, thousands of people that live in uh, um, similar style homes, have a similar language. If you went back to 1492 and you went to a Caddo village and you could somehow speak the language and you said, um, are you Caddo? And this person might say, you yeah, know, I, I understand what you're talking about. I, I'm, I'm Caddo. But then you go to the next village over village might look exactly the same as the village you just visited, but they wouldn't see themselves as belonging to the same group as their next door neighbor. Now you would because you'd see these uh, common cultural uh, signifiers, but it's not like they see themselves as, as the same group. So today we're used to labeling ourselves as American, you know, Irish, uh, Mexican, Canadian. We, you know, identify ourselves by our nation or, or cultural heritage. That's not what we're doing here. So today we're going to be sort of as historians putting labels on groups of people, trying to categorize them to understand them. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to fit in these type groups. So when we talk about the Caddos, for example, there's a very similar group, but different in a lot of ways, called the Wichitas. You might have a group of people that you know, one person might cl classify as a Wichita, but somebody else might classify as a Caddo. There's going to be some crossover. And again, when we talk about these groups, it's not like they're all going to adhere to the same rules. So if you go to the Caddo, there's no Caddo King. It's just a cultural grouping. So keep that in mind. It's uh, We're categorizing these groups to better understand them, but the labels aren't going to fit perfectly. All right, with that in mind, let's talk about the Indians of Texas in 1492. So as we mentioned, uh, about 2000 BC, we're going to see agriculture first arrive in Texas, um, probably somewhere around here in what's today Presidio. Now the agriculture that's going to arrive, it's going to come up from Mexico. We don't know exactly what comes first, but the three primary crops that are going to arrive from uh, Mexico are going to be corn, bean, and squash. Okay, You'll sometimes he hear these referred to as the Three Sisters. The reason they're called the Three Sisters is they're complementary to one another in terms of growth and in terms of what they mean to the human diet. Okay, So squash um, provides certain things to humans, certain nutrition, plant fiber, things like that. Bean, beans provide uh, protein to humans. Uh, corn provides carbohydrates, things you need for humans to live. These three plants also help one another grow. So corn has these long stalks, and uh, this allows uh, squash, their vines, to grow up the stalks, which allows them to get sun easier. And the beans uh, provide nitrogen for both the squash and the corn. So, you know, every after you plant crops for a certain amount of time, nitrogen runs out in the soil. But if you have beans, uh, it replenishes the soil much easier. Well, these crops arrived from Mesoamerica, people in Texas, and then we're going to see very quickly in New Mexico, start growing these things. Actually, I shouldn't use the word quickly because once agriculture arrives north of Mexico, it's going to be a very slow process making its way up. Now, this isn't uh, as bad to grow crops as you're going to see down here in northern Mexico, but right here in the American Southwest isn't that great for growing crops either. So once about 2000 BC, we start seeing crops up here, we're gonna see it slowly be adopted by the people of the Southwest, okay? So you're gonna have a couple people, you know, not immediately throw down their spears and say, uh, I'm now a sedentary agriculturalist. Instead, it's gonna be, you know, hey, you know, I see this guy down south of me growing some of these crops, he's doing well. Why don't I throw a couple things down here in the soil and then uh, I'll continue to hunt game. Uh, well, again, the same process happened, you know, down in Mesoamerica in the Andes where people slowly get caught in this agricultural trap. And eventually you're going to have some people that spend their full time uh, uh, growing agriculture. And I should say that, again, like down here, 
uh, you're going to see there's still uh, hunters going out and supplementing the diet, providing protein, additional protein for the people of, uh, of these agricultural tribes simply because they don't have the megafauna animals to raise for milk and, and protein like you see in uh, Europe and Africa and Asia. Um, but for the most part, you're going to be uh, entirely agricultural. So uh, this agriculture starts slowly making its way up. And what we'll see is that the people of the Southwest are going to be slow to adopt it again because the environment is very harsh and it's not the perfect place for agriculture. It doesn't rain very often. Um, you know, when it does rain, it can rain a lot, but then not rain for a very long time. The soil isn't exactly uh, fertile. And so outside of places like rivers, you know, this agriculture isn't going to grow. Well, the first group of people north of Mexico to uh, uh, grow these crops are going to be a group we refer to as the Pueblo culture. And this Pueblo culture, again, do not think about this as a nation. Don't think about it as there's a Pueblo king. It's just a label we're putting on this group of people that share similar architecture, a similar language, similar culture to one another, okay? So the Pueblo culture, the thing that uh, most identifies it is they're going to start developing technology, uh, uh, cultural techniques uh, to better uh, deal with this agriculture in an, in an environment that's not great for growing stuff, okay? So the Pueblo culture, one of the things that you can identify from it, and again, this is going to extend from down here in Texas all the way up the Rio Grande, a little bit outside of it into some neighboring rivers, but primarily along the Rio Grande. Uh, one of the things you're going to see with this is that um, the Pueblo culture is going to have to use, uh, uh, it's going to be sedentary. Once you start growing food full time, you're going to be around your crops. You're not going to be chasing game from one place to another. Uh, so you're going to be sedentary, so you need permanent houses. Well, in the southwest, there's not a lot of trees. There are some trees, but not nearly as many as other areas. So one of the identifying factors for the Pueblo culture is adobe. It's essentially this mud brick. You make houses out of it. Um, there's cooling properties to it. So during the summer, uh, the adobe keeps you cool. During the winter, uh, it keeps you warm. So that's one of the identifying factors about this Pueblo culture. Uh, another thing about the Pueblo culture is that um, you will have a lot of places to store crops. So the southwest, again, rain is very infrequent. So in order to survive summers where there's simply not enough rain to, you know, uh, for your crops to grow, what the Pueblo culture will do is over time they'll learn to bury their corn or stores of corn in years when things are plentiful. So if you ever look at a Pueblo culture village, a lot of times you'll see these uh, pit houses. Now, sometimes these are ceremonial centers, but a lot of times this is just a place to store corn. So a year, let's say the uh, rains a lot, got more corn than uh, your population needs. Uh, beans, uh, squash doesn't preserve as well, but you uh, stick it in one of these pit houses. Next year comes along and uh, th there's not enough rain. Well, you'll be fine because you have a lot of corn stored here. So uh, that's another identifying factor to these uh, Pueblo culture people. Um, one other thing you'll notice about Pueblo culture people is that uh, they have a lot of uh, roads. So if you go up and down the Rio Grande, or if you did in 1492, you would see a lot of roads between Pueblo culture towns. Now this doesn't mean that one Pueblo culture is necessarily aligned with another. This is something we're going to have to make clear when we talk about the conquistadors there was no Pueblo culture king. You would occasionally see uh, one Pueblo culture town aligned with another, but a lot of times they were just independent. But because of sort of the scarcity of resources and you know the harshness of the environment in the Southwest, you would see a lot of trade between these various towns. So uh, you're gonna see these roads are usually about uh, uh, you know, sometimes 20 feet wide, you know, these dirt roads going from one town to another. So let's say one town doesn't get enough rain, uh, but ne the town next, uh, next over for whatever reason does, then you'll, um, you know, have one town maybe trade flint or some resource that they have in abundance for, for additional food. Uh, another thing you'll see about Pueblo culture towns is that uh, they're filled with things like irrigation ditches. So if you go um, outside of this place, you'll you know have the Rio Grande or something like that. 
and uh, maybe they'll dig an irrigation ditch to flood uh, the fields of crops, you know. So in years where there's not enough rain, you can get enough water for your crops through, uh, through irrigation. Uh, other things you'll notice, um, this is actually, this is a bigger Pueblo culture town. This would be something in New Mexico. We're not going to have, in Texas, uh, cities as big as this. Um, we're going to have smaller cities because if you look, Texas is sort of at the uh, edge of Pueblo culture. The heart is going to be right around this area. We're sort of the edge and sort of the distant cousins. The technology is not going to get here as much as it it is sort of going to be shared in the center here. But here in Texas, we are going to have um, a town similar to this, okay? And, and the, the place in particular uh, we're going to talk about, actually we'll talk about in just a second, is down here in La Junta de los Rios. So Pueblo culture, as it sort of spreads out, and, and by the way, this again is going to be a long process for this culture to develop. Agriculture gets there, and, and by 1492, agriculture has taken hold, and all these people around here are sedentary agriculturalists growing food the whole uh, whole time. By the way, some people outside of here are still going to be hunter-gatherers in 1492. We'll talk about them soon. Uh, but right around this area, all sedentary agriculturalists. In these towns that range from some cases in New Mexico, you have towns that uh, uh, can be upwards of 30,000 people. You know, most on average, you'll see towns 3,000, 4,000 people. In Texas and, and sort of at the edge of Pueblo culture, some of the towns are going to be a little bit smaller, uh, just again because they're outside the cultural center. And that's going to be the case with one sort of little uh, finger outside of this Pueblo culture uh, here in the Texas Panhandle, this Antelope Creek phase. We don't know much about this Antelope Creek phase except for. Uh, we found ruins that are Pueblo culture ruins in the panhandle of Texas today. Not anything big. You know, these would be a smaller Pueblo town. These are single-story adobe homes. Uh, but we have evidence that people there grew, drew, grew corn, beans, and squash. Uh, we have pit houses where they store their corn. Unfortunately, these people aren't going to survive very long after 1492 for reasons we'll talk about uh, later. So we don't know much about them. All right. So... This is just sort of one offshoot of the Pueblo culture we have in Texas. Uh, part of Texas and a part of Pueblo culture that will survive past, uh, long past 1492 is going to be a group of people that live here at the juncture of the Rio Grande River and the Conchos River that uh, Spanish explorers will later call the La Junta de los Rios, or the juncture of the rivers. So the reason that there's going to be this sort of, uh, you know, outcropping of the Pueblo culture is because this area down here is fertile, all right? So a lot of the area actually between part of Pueblo culture and down here isn't very fertile. So you get some sort of groups, and we'll talk about some of these later on, like the Monsos and the Sumas, that you kind of call Pueblo culture, but they are barely surviving. They, they are growing food, but uh, because, you know, just the land isn't as good. You don't see large towns. Well, you are going to see large towns in this place, again, right on the U.S.-Mexico border, Rio Grande, Conchos River. You are going to see some large Pueblo uh, culture towns, okay? The Junta de los Rios, when the Spanish first arrived in the region, they estimate about 10,000 people in a couple uh, towns throughout the, the junction of the river, okay? And these are Pueblo culture towns. So um, you'll see right here, most of these uh, buildings are just going to be single-story adobe, uh, adobe buildings, but some of the larger settlements, some are going to be on the Texas side, some are going to be on the Mexico side, would be something like this where you would have maybe 2,000 people living in these Pueblo homes. You would have the uh, fields with corn, beans, and squash outside of them. Uh, farmers would you know, uh, leave their you know, home during the day, probably living here with... Uh, wife and, and uh, family, maybe extended family, go out, grow crops, come back, feed their family. Next day, do the same thing. Occasionally, maybe you would send hunters out to supplement the diet by hunting deer or antelope, uh, uh, things like that. But you're getting most of your resources out here. Again, between the various towns on uh, the uh, in La Junta de los Rios, uh, maybe 10,000 people altogether. And these, this is part of the Pueblo culture. So we're going to collectively call these groups the Juntans, although, again, there's a couple towns in this area. They're not single town, 
And for the most part, these towns trade with one another, but they're not under a single king. They're just people that share a uh, similar culture to uh, one another and a similar culture to the Pueblos uh, up in New Mexico. So think of these guys as sedentary agriculturalists and part of the Pueblo culture. Um, again, this would be sort of a uh, Pueblo culture tile, style home. So if you were to go to La Junta de los Rios, you would maybe find um, uh, something like this. So maybe you'd live here with your extended family, have um, you know a blanket you made out of uh, uh, deer that the, the hunter gathered. Sometimes you would have cotton clothing, and that's something that people don't think about with American Indians. Uh, but we actually had uh, people working cotton here in New Mexico in the western part of Texas. So sedentary agriculturalists. Uh, again, this would be another picture of the uh, um, you see the corn, or I'm sorry, the squash right here, corn over there, um, peppers. That's actually another uh, uh, common crop that you see in Pueblo culture. Um, so again, this is a, if you were a Hunton, you would live something like this. Now there's another group in far west Texas we don't know as much about as the Huntins, but the thing is they might actually be Huntins themselves. So one of the, when the first Europeans arrived, they would see this group that they called the Humanos, and the Humanos were always at La Junta de los Rios when the Europeans showed up. And the thing with the Humanos is, you know, the first explorers described them as hunters and traders. So we don't know if this was sort of people from La Junta that would go out, hunt for part of the year, come back, return with buffalo or, uh, you know, protein sources and they were sort of related to the people here, but they were just an uh, offshoot or just a, a segment of the population that liked to go hunting, um, or if they're an entirely different group that was just friendly with the Pueblo culture, uh, Huntins down here. So again, we're not sure if we're talking about an entirely different group or if we're talking about a separate, more hunter-gatherer group uh, than the Huntins. We're not 100% sure today. What we do know about the Humanos is they would constantly trade down here, and we know that they would conduct this trade across this plains area, which we'll talk about in a second. Not a lot of people live in this plains area, and they would trade extensively over here in East Texas, which as we'll talk about in a little bit, there's a lot of there's a big population over here, and then they would return every year uh, with goods that they collected here down to uh, uh, La Junta. Some people think the Humanos are basically these people that operate this huge trade network that basically goods would come all the way uh, up from Mesoamerica uh, all the way to La Junta, then Humanos would bring them here to uh, the eastern part of North America, and they bring products down here, which would go down to Mesoamerica, which some of the products would go up here to the rest of the Pueblos in New Mexico. We just know that they would make annual migrations and sort of link together uh, these sedentary civilizations uh, in East Texas and at, I'm sorry, West Texas and as we're about to talk about in East Texas. So Humanos mysterious group may be part of the Pueblo culture or maybe just really good buddies with the Pueblo culture. So sedentary agriculturalists, there's another group of sedentary agriculturalists in Texas and it's going to be far East Texas that have nothing to do with the Pueblo culture. This is going to be a group called the Mississippi culture. A uh, couple things you know, need to know about the Mississippi culture. One is that they're not going to come along until much later than the Pueblo culture begins to develop. Again, 2000 BC, uh, agriculture reaches out here, then we start to see it slowly take on here in the Southwest. Well, agriculture isn't going to reach the Eastern part of North America until something around 700 AD. There's a lot of debate about this, but uh, let's just say 700 AD. It takes a long time because just like northern Mexico, this area extending here and again going all the way down to northern Mexico, the, there's not, it's hard to grow crops in this area. There's rivers are really shallow. It doesn't have as much rainfall as you're going to see east of, again, what's today, right around I-35. It's just not good for growing crops. Today we grow crops uh, up here because we found all these aquifers and we have technology to bring water from distant places to water crops. But back then, obviously you didn't have that up until really uh, past 150 years, you didn't have that. We didn't know these aquifers were under, under the ground. 
So our bread basket couldn't possibly be a bread bread basket back in American Indian times because they didn't have the technology. And again, we uh, Americans didn't have the technology until uh, past 150 years ago or so. So this area is just dry. The soil's bad. It doesn't grow crops very well. So agriculture is not going to, it's going to take a very long time to spread east. Maybe it somehow spreads east, you know, slowly people start to adopt it down here. We're going to talk about some groups down there. Maybe, you know, an early predecessor to the Humanos, somebody brought it over here. Uh, in about 700 AD, we start seeing uh, people plant food over, over here in East Texas or whatever. We don't know exactly how it happened. But once agriculture reaches this area where you start to see it, it's a lot more fertile, a lot more rainfall, this stuff is going to take off. Like over here again, slow process, here rapid process. The second you get agriculture, corn, beans, squash, everybody starts growing it. And particularly, they're going to start growing it in this very fertile region this, uh, around the Mississippi River and sort of these uh, extending all the way North Carolina uh, down into Louisiana. Uh, the second agriculture gets there, the groups that grow agriculture are going to have excess calories. They're going to have populations going to start to grow because of these excess calories. And uh, when that happens, they're going to start growing more powerful than their neighbors. So their neighbors, you know, maybe they're hunter gatherers. They're going to look at, you know, their neighbors now growing these new crops and they're going to have a choice. Either I can stay hunter gatherer. If that's the case, you know, my neighbors are going to, they're tripling in population every generation. They're going to kick me off my land, or I can start growing crops as well. My my population uh, uh, will grow uh, fairly easily as well. However, this happens, people will quickly give up uh, hunting and gathering the second agricultural hits over here. And within just a couple hundred years, agriculture is going to spread all the way around here. And again, you compare that to over here, it really takes thousands of years for agriculture to spread all throughout this Pueblo culture area, but just within a couple hundred years, because this is so suitable for growing uh, crops, it's gonna it's gonna spread here in the Mississippi culture area. So it starts spreading. It's gonna particularly be uh, big in the areas right around the Mississippi and down here, uh, Alabama, Mississippi area, uh, where things are particularly fertile. So unlike the Pueblo culture, which was defined by the um, scarcity of water and sort of the difficulty in growing crops, Mississippi culture is going to almost be defined by excess. You're going to have so many people uh, uh, come out of this that you're going to see a lot of uh, additional workers. You know, that fertile land, you only have to have a couple people growing the crops. You can have more people making art. So you'll see pottery like this. You'll also see, you know, towns grow really rapidly. You'll see uh, towns, you know, by 1000 AD, towns are going to be uh, over 10,000 people. We have a couple of them uh, in the eastern part of North America. Uh, towns will look somewhat like this. This is, uh, this is actually one of the bigger Mississippi culture towns. Uh, this is in southern Illinois. But you'll see some of the features you're going to see in, in uh, some of the Mississippi culture towns in Texas. You'll have little um, sports areas. You'll have you know uh, homes for people to live in. You live in one of these homes with your extended family. Uh, you would maybe go out, grow corn, beans, squash in the fields. This is where they're growing their food. Um, and you also see in these Mississippi culture towns, usually they leave an area, um, and this would be the same Pueblo culture towns, you always leave areas uh, wooded where you can hunt your game. Again, they don't have cows. They don't have um, the domesticated animals Europeans do. So you always got to have a source of protein. So usually you leave a wooded area and again, more cropland. You go out, you grow your crops, come home at night, and also you would have these ceremonial functions. So Mississippi culture, again, so much food, so much extra laborers, they started building a lot of monumental architecture. And what I say uh, about that is they would start creating things not for the purpose of getting food, uh, but for just, hey, we can do it. Think about like why people built the pyramids or uh, you know, the, the Colosseum. Uh, it's not something you need to survive. It's just something for show or maybe some elites want it for, you know, personal reasons or maybe they need it for show to get the people to listen to them better. But in Mississippi culture towns, it's not going to be pyramids. Well, I guess a kind of pyramids, but or a Colosseum. Um, it's going to be these earth mounds. So 
Uh, you're going to see these earth mounds, they vary in shape, but these things can be really big. This is one um, called Monk's Mound. Now, this might not look like much, um, but if you compare that to a car down here, it's kind of big. But this, uh, at its heyday, would have been multiple layers of, um, of uh, uh, dirt. So the first layer would have been uh, like white dirt, next layer red dirt, next layer black dirt. And a lot of times they would import this dirt from hundreds of miles away. So you'd have to have workers carrying sacks for hundreds of miles. Again, they don't have horses. They killed them off during the megafauna extinction. At least their ancestors did. So that would be a, a long way to, to uh, ship this stuff in. Now, Texas, we're not going to have as big a mounds as this. We certainly are going to have mounds, though. Uh, in the mounds in East Texas, you go out there today, there's still a lot of these things out in East Texas. Again, more probably in the heart of Mississippi culture area in Mississippi, Alabama. But you go to East Texas, you're going to find these burial mounds. They're going to be grown over with trees and things uh, by now. But if you dig into these, you'll find, again, different layers of dirt. So maybe first guy that builds it, um, builds it in black dirt. Maybe that's local to the area. And, you know, he buries some art along with him. Maybe uh, the local leader and his wife and kids uh, are, are buried in there. Maybe some, you know, uh, weapons of war or something like that. Next layer, he dies. This is the, you know, mound, just a single layer. Next generation, maybe imports dirt, you know, brown dirt from 100 miles away, builds a second layer. Maybe you know, generation down the road builds this one, generation down the road builds this one, and you'll have these huge mounds. And at the top of the mounds, usually the elites would make their homes, or you'd have, you know, the shaman uh, perform religious ceremonies uh, for the people uh, in, in these, these various mound uh, cities. So this is the Mississippi culture. Again, this would be a, what a Mississippi culture town looks like. And you'll notice the palisades or the walls around them the thing about Mississippi culture, just like Pueblo culture, there's no Pueblo king, or I'm sorry, Mississippi culture king. There's no, the people would understand the same language and live in similar style homes. They would have, usually have mounds uh, in their cities, but they might not like one another. They might trade with their neighbor. They might be at war with their neighbor. There's not somebody that says, I'm the ki king of all Mississippi people. And again, you know, the, the Mississippi culture Indians, they, they might not even identify themselves as Mississippi culture. It's us putting, uh, in modern times, putting labels on people back then. And again, you see these palisades. This is evidence of that. Uh, maybe there's a Mississippi culture town next to them that um, they're at war with. So to protect their people, they put uh, these walls around them. So here in Texas, in East Texas is fertile. But it's not as fertile as it is here in, uh, you know, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. So we, uh, the people in East Texas don't have the surplus of laborers to build as, as big a mounds as you're going to see, again, you know, southern Illinois, uh, Alabama, Mississippi. But you will see in East Texas mound people, Mississippi culture people, people that share similar language, similar culture to people out here. Uh, in the heart of Mississippi culture area. So the group we have in Texas that we consider Mississippi culture is these Caddo's, okay? And these Caddo's, uh, they're gonna be uh, across the East East Texas border with uh, Louisiana, so they're gonna be Caddo's in Louisiana. Uh, the Caddo's are gonna live in, you know, towns of, say, um, a couple hundred to a couple hundred thousand, or I'm sorry, a couple thousand. Um, the Caddo's will live in permanent homes. So if you're born in a uh, Caddo town, you're probably going to die in a Caddo town. You're going to be growing corn, beans, and squash. Maybe you'll, you'll hunt occasionally to supplement your diet. But you're living in the same place you're born. It's not moving from one place to another. It's not following game herds. You're there the whole year, okay? The uh, thing that distinguishes the Caddo's from a lot of Mississippi culture uh, Indians is that they have these um, sort of beehive-like uh, buildings made of straw, and they're very tall. You see this is a picture of uh, some caddos building one. Uh, you'll see it's on the mound sort of platform right there, in smaller mound than you would see in, in the heart of Mississippi culture. Uh, this is a recreation of a caddo mound. And so, again, like the uh, other Mississippi culture towns, you live here maybe with your extended family, and every day you'd go out, you'd work the fields, corn, beans, squash, 
uh, you know, gather what, what you're going to eat, bring it in here at night. Actually, very similar, you'd see, uh, to what Europeans uh, were living like at the time, at least European peasants, which uh, uh, most Europeans were peasants, very few in the elite uh, in 1492. So uh, go out, get corn, bean, squash, come in here and eat. This is another picture of a Caddo town. Uh, again, sometimes uh, a couple hundred people, sometimes you get a couple thousand people. As a matter of fact, some people estimate in 1492 there are about 200,000 Caddo spread in towns uh, through, throughout the, on the border of East Texas and Louisiana, again, living in these permanent style homes. You'll sometimes hear the Caddo's referred to as the Romans of Texas because they uh, um, you know, uh, were so, such an advanced society when compared to, to those west of them and outside of the, the Huntons. So uh, 200,000 people uh, we would say these, these caddos. They actually were bigger a little bit before that, uh, but there had been some climate change in, in the uh, 1300s that had reduced their population. So maybe even bigger than 200,000 uh, previously. One final interesting thing about the caddos, we talked about place names being named after Indian words. Texas is actually named after a caddo word. So when the first uh, uh, Europeans are going to come to the caddo area, I shouldn't say first Europeans, the first missionaries, they're going to talk to the Caddo's. The Caddo's are going to mention this word, Tejas, and the missionaries are going to assume that they're talking about the place they're at. They write Tejas on a map, and eventually this is going to become synonymous with Texas. We think the Caddo's were either maybe identifying themselves were the Tejas, or they might have been saying friend, we're your friend, uh, and that became Tejas, and the missionaries just misunderstood. Whatever the reason, this is uh, Texas is named after the Caddo's. All right, so these are the sedentary agriculturalists in Texas. They again, this branch of the pueblos, particularly here at La Junta de los Rios, and then uh, this sort of uh, outcropping of the Mississippi culture, the Caddo's. Again, not as advanced as the heart of the Pueblo culture, not as advanced as the heart of the Mississippi culture, sort of the, the outskirts of it. And that, by the way, is going to be a theme. Texas, not really going to be the heart of anything until the middle of the 1800s, sort of at the outskirts of everything else. All right, so sedentary agriculturalists, people that stay in one place all the time. Well, there are other groups of Indians in Texas, okay? And there are other agricultural groups in Texas. So. When agriculture spread out uh, and spread east, we're going to have people adopt it outside of the Mississippi culture. This is just going to be where it spreads quickest because this is the most fertile area. But you're going to see people in, you know, sort of the edge of central Texas, uh, uh, east Texas. They're going to grow crops as well. But because the land isn't as good as it is out here, uh, because maybe they, they're you know, still need laborers or additional people to go hunting and gathering. They're not going to be permanent agricultural societies. So what we'll see in Texas is some groups that we would call semi-sedentary. So they'll grow food, but they're not going to be as advanced as we'd see in the Pueblo culture area or Mississippi culture area. So this is going to be groups like the Wichita's, so semi-sedentary. So the Wichita's are very, very similar in a lot of ways to the Caddo's. They actually have some language ties to the Caddo's. Um, they are going to build semi-permanent homes like the Caddo's, like you'd see uh, right here. This is a Wichita grass hut. But the difference between the Wichita's and the Caddo's is the Wichita's, you're not going to have the mounds. It's not as, uh, um, there's just not as many laborers. There's not as much uh, calories to go around to devote laborers to that. Uh, and the thing with the Wichita's is they are going to occasionally pick up and go hunt buffalo. So Wichita's are very unusual. You can kind of think of them as a cross between hunter-gatherers and sedentary agriculturalists. So certain times, maybe agriculture isn't growing well, maybe the Wichita's will just pick up, leave, go out and go hunting uh, buffalo, um, and then, then maybe uh, it starts raining again. Then they return to their original spot and start uh, planting agriculture. Now, the weird thing about the Wichita's is that sometimes they would stay in one place for dozen years, dozens of years, 50 years in, in at least one instance. Uh, so they're kind of sedentary, but they also pick up and 
and, and go off and, and, and hunt animals for long periods of time as well. And they can live without agriculture if necessary. So think of them as kind of cattle-like, but also kind of like a group we're going to talk about later, the Apaches, who are entirely hunter-gatherers, right? So that's going to be the Wichita, semi-sedentary. Um, uh, another group that we will talk about, oh, this is, uh, you sometimes see Wichita's not building uh, their huts out of grass. Sometimes you would see them building them out of uh, uh, buffalo hide. So if you're more permanent, if you, you know the rains are falling, you might live in a village filled with these things and have fields of corn, bean, squash. But then during times where there's uh, you need to hunt buffalo, then you switch to these homes that can be constructed very quickly and you can follow the game herds. All right, so that's the Wichita's. Another semi-sedentary group, meaning unlike the Caddo's and the Hoontons, you know, they don't stay in one place uh, their whole lives. Another group would be the Karankawas, okay? Karankawas, again, live in this area. Not as perfect for agriculture as over here, but you can grow food here. Uh, so what the Karankawas would do is they would have a yearly migration. So they would plant crops a certain part of year, but instead of tending to them, instead of doing all the things necessary to make sure the crops are going to grow perfectly, instead of, you know, uh, plowing the fields really deep and like the caddos would, instead of, you know, picking the bugs off, that kind of stuff, crocodiles will just throw their seeds down. Uh, they will, uh, you know, put a little bit of effort into to, uh, putting them in the ground, but then they're going to take off and they're going to do the seasonal migration to the coast where crops don't grow that well, but there's plenty of fish uh, and you can get oysters, things like that. So they have a yearly migration. So let's say, again, there's going to be dozens of these Karankawa groups, maybe your particular group. Uh, you plant your crops here and then every year you walk 60 miles down here to the coast. You spend a couple months here fishing and then during the winter you return here, you harvest your crops, you live there. And, you know, uh, Maybe you move occasionally. Maybe the uh, agriculture's not get good here. Maybe you have enemy uh, tribes coming after you. So maybe you move down here. Then you still have your seasonal migration. You go down here to the coast. So they're not staying in one place all the time. They're moving from one place to another. So this would be a, a view of a Karankawa village. Uh, again, you see the fish. Uh, you see these dogs. And as a matter of fact, the word Karankawa we think means dog lover because they... You know, among other Indian groups, had domesticated dogs. Uh, if you look at a coyote, that's pretty much what um, uh, wild domesticated dog from Indians uh, in the Kronk was. Uh, had plenty of these, which probably assisted them in uh, hunting. You see they're supplementing their diet with deer, uh, and then they're fishing. You don't see any crops around in this particular painting because uh, that would be at their other location. Uh, when, you know, they go back to their crop area and you see people out here gathering oysters, you see the fish drying over here and you see these homes that can be picked up and move uh, fairly quickly again because these guys are semi-sedentary. So that's the Kronkwas. Uh, a couple fun facts about the Kronkwas. One of the things that people always remember about them, there's going to be some accusations that they're cannibals by Europeans. We don't know if that's true. Um, we, there's accusations of cannibals uh, thrown uh, left and right, but one of the things that is uh, is true, one of the groups in Texas, by the way, we will talk about later on, is going to be cannibals, but we're, we're not 100% sure about the Kronk was. One thing we are sure about, and I think it's an interesting fun fact, is living here on the coast, there's a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, so one of the ways that the Kronk was uh, would you know prevent mosquitoes from getting them was they would uh, kill these alligators, take the alligator grease, and rub it all over themselves. They don't obviously don't have citronella oil and all the stuff we have today. So that's how they kept the mosquitoes off. Sometimes they would rub thick mud on them uh, to keep the mosquitoes off. Sometimes they would, you know, create fires and have the smoke that would um, uh, waft over their home. So you got to breathe in smoke, but it's better than be bitten all night by mosquitoes. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting fact about these Karankwas. So those are the semi-sedentary groups uh, of Texas, okay? So sedentary, sedentary, semi-sedentary right here. What about this area here where it doesn't look like agriculture can be grown? And by the way, this area extends all the way up here into Canada, 
and then all the way down here into northern Mexico, all the way south to right, uh, right at the area of Mesoamerica. Again, we talk about this area being poor for growing food. Well, who lives in here? This is going to be the uh, hunter-gatherer. So even though agriculture spreads pretty much throughout North America by 1492, some people said thank you but no thank you. And by the way, again, some people in Europe at this time, still hunter-gatherers, Africa, uh, Asia, Australia, people are still hunter-gatherers in portions of those areas. So it's just simply some people just say it's impractical to grow food in these areas. Uh, and so we're going to have a couple groups in Texas that, um, that, that don't grow food, that are still hunter-gatherers. And in some ways, these groups are going to be very similar to those who lived uh, in, in uh, Texas 15, you know, 15,000 years ago when the first people arrived in Texas. Uh, you know, they'll be very similar at moving from one place to another, changing at, chasing after game herds, things like that. Uh, one group we're going to talk about is the Coil Tekans, all right? So uh, sometimes you'll see the Spanish basically refer to these guys as the Chichimecas, uh, and you're going to see the term Chichimeca applied to all hunter-gatherer groups uh, that the Spanish encounter when they first arrived from central Mexico all the way uh, up to, again, Canada. Uh, but the uh, modern historians have put the name Coaltecans on it. And the Coaltecans are specifically referring to these groups here in South Texas, you know, uh, northern Mexico. These groups that, you know, they're south of where Buffalo are. It's in this incredibly dry, poor area, this Edwards Plateau area that uh, doesn't get a lot of rainfall uh, because there's not a lot of plant life, there's not a lot of animal life. And it's sort of just a rough area to live in, unless you have modern conveniences. So the Coaltecans, their defining feature is we can't grow food and then animal life's not plentiful. So they, their almost defining feature is that they simply have to make do with uh, whatever they can. So if you go to a Coaltecan camp, you'll find um, uh, people gathering berries like you see over here. Uh, sometimes you'd be hunting deer, although deer aren't, isn't that plentiful uh, down here in, in the this, this south uh, uh, Texas area. So sometimes Coaltecans resort to eating just stuff that other people, we today and then people back then, would find gross. Things like uh, deer dung. They would dig through that to find berries. They would eat spiders, lizards, snakes. Uh, and even after eating these gross things, they uh, sometimes still didn't have enough to survive. Uh, Coaltecans, you know, this is sort of the opposite of the sedentary places in Texas where you have villages sometime in the thousands. Uh, here in the Coaltecans, hunter-gatherers, so sometimes uh, a dozen people, sometimes two dozen people, uh, that's it. Uh, and a lot of times even that's too much. You know, you're uh, wandering constantly looking for food over this, this vast area of South Texas. Maybe you don't have enough people, enough food to support um, uh, the people in your tribe. So you sometimes see cold Tekkens killing infants in times of scarcity, particularly female in infants, because they view that as if my uh, female infant gets uh, captured by an enemy, it grows my enemy uh, population. Um, we don't have the food, and so they would kill female in infants a lot of times at, at birth. So it's just poor, poor way of life, constantly searching for food. Uh, you're constantly competing with other cold Tekken groups. And again, if you if you're going to ask the Coltecans, there's no Coltecan at King. These guys are so divided; they're constantly competing with one another. Probably hundreds of these uh, different uh, hunter-gatherer groups down here in South Texas. Okay, so uh, those are the Coltecans. Um, this would be a Spanish uh, sort of picture of uh, Coltecans. Another group of hunter-gatherers, or primarily hunter-gatherers, is going to be this group called the Apaches. Now, the thing about the Apaches is they very rarely grew agriculture. Sometimes you would see them throw down some corn occasionally and then return to it after a year searching uh, for animals. But most of the time, the Apaches are going to be wandering the plains following buffalo. Okay, This would probably be the closest thing you have in Texas to um, uh, the stereotypical Indian uh, it, you, know, you would see in movies. So the Apaches, one thing you need to point out, they didn't have horses. Uh, so this would be a later uh, depiction of the, the Apaches. They didn't have horses in 1492. Horses 
all went extinct with the megafauna extinction, at least in North America, they're not going to get them later until Europeans arrived. So what the Apaches would do is they would follow the buffalo herds around, you know, have a couple dogs. Usually the dogs would be the ones dragging the teepees behind them. And then they'd move from one place to another, hunt the buffalo, and then um, use the buffalo to... Uh, 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 use buffalo to, you know, uh, make their, their tents, eat the meat, uh, things like that. Usually the men are doing the hunting. The women in Apache society be the ones cleaning the buffalo uh, hides to make the tents or blankets, things like that, following the uh, buffalo from one place to another. Now, this isn't, this isn't uh, you know, going to, uh, you're constantly searching for food. Again, hunter-gatherers, but it's not going to be, as bad as the cold Texans, because buffalo are pretty plentiful in 1492. Uh, so, so it's not uh, like the Apaches are going to be starving. The Apaches, by the way, again, not a single group. You'd have one group of Apaches fighting another group. It's just they share a similar language, and they have this sort of uh, plains tribe uh, uh, culture where they constantly uh, follow game herds. Okay, again, occasionally planting corn. Uh, but but primarily hunter gatherers. So those are the tribes in Texas in 1492. You'll notice there's one group that is missing that most people think about when they think about Texas, and that is the Comanches. Okay, the Comanches were not in Texas in 1492. As a matter of fact, the Comanches didn't exist as a distinct Indian group in 1492. They're not going to come along until much later. Uh, when um, the horse gets to the plains. Basically, we'll talk about this, but a group of Indians up here, uh, they start acquiring the horse. They're going to start using it in all aspects of their lives. Then they're going to start expanding because the horse makes them so powerful, and they're going to push their way into Texas. So the Comanches, this tribe that we think of as the most Texas of Indian tribes, did not exist in 1492, but we think about them when we think about Texas history. Now, why is that the case? Well, a lot of it is going to be because, uh, here be a picture of the Comanches, uh, a lot of that, by the way, there are other groups that are going to, we're going to later see in Texas uh, that we don't, that, that weren't there in 1492. Uh, what we're going to see is that a lot of those groups we initially talked about, they're going to be pushed away or they're going to be killed off or they're going to disappear for a lot of reasons. And these other Indian groups are going to come in and sort of, uh, you know, take over where they were living uh, or, you know, move in for a variety of different reasons. One of the reasons that we're going to see this change is, is because a lot of these groups are going to start dying off because of the introduction of disease. And this goes back to the megafauna thing. People of the Americas didn't have the immunities uh, uh, that people in Europe, Asia, and Africa did. And so a lot of these guys are going to start dying off. And this is going to start this dramatic uh, shift that's going to start leaving some people to die out, other people to uh, start flourishing. And, and we'll talk about that next time when we talk about the first uh, Europeans to arrive in Texas. This beginning of this shift in dynamics that leads a lot of these people to start moving away and a lot of these other groups to start moving in and a lot of other groups, including the Spanish, Mexicans, and Americans, to start moving into Texas. So we will talk about that next time.